The life of the bee will be the life of our race, says Nikola Tesla, world-famed scientist. A new sex order is coming, with the female as superior. You will communicate instantly by simple vest pocket equipment. Aircraft will travel the skies, unmanned, driven and guided by radio. Enormous power will be transmitted great distances, without wires. Earthquakes will become more and more frequent. Temperate zones will turn frigid or torrid. And some of these awe-inspiring developments are not so very far off. From the inception of the wireless system, I saw that this new art of applied electricity would be of greater benefit to the human race than any other scientific discovery, for it virtually eliminates distance. The majority of the ills from which humanity suffers are due to the immense extent of the terrestrial globe and the inability of individuals and nations to come into close contact. Wireless will achieve the closer contact through transmission of intelligence, transport of our bodies and materials, and conveyance of energy. When wireless is perfectly applied, the whole Earth will be converted into a huge brain. Which, in fact, it is, all things being particles of a real and rhythmic whole. We shall be able to communicate with one another instantly, irrespective of distance. Not only this, but through television and telephony, we shall see and hear one another as perfectly as though we were face to face, despite intervening distances of thousands of miles. And the instruments through which we will be able to do this will be amazingly simple compared to our present telephone. A man will be able to carry one in his vest pocket. We shall be able to witness and hear events. The inauguration of a president, the playing of a World Series game, the havoc of an earthquake, or the terror of a battle. Just as though we were present. Edison had a good deal to do with the bringing out of the telephone. Perhaps he could conceive of something better than the telephone, better than the telegraph. Something that would utilize a new force of which mankind is not yet conscious. He could conceive of such a force. So far as I know, there is no quality of the ether that will permit us to send wave impulses in other than the electrical form. But I have no doubt that wave impulses can be sent in other, and perhaps, better forms. I do know, however, that the present telephone is very imperfect. If you want to know how imperfect it is, read the drug market to a stereographer at the other end of the wire and see how much of it he or she will get. The success of the telephone is due to the human imagination. A man is rung up on the phone, he gets a clue to the identity of the person who is calling him, and if the subject broached is one with which he is familiar, the rest is easy. But mention a name that the other person did not expect to hear and see how quickly he will break in with a, what's that? Repeat the name and, finally, spell it. Edison believes the day will come when the telephone will leave little or nothing to the imagination, when it will shout out proper names or whisper the quotations from the drug market. When I am trying to make a thing, I always play my blue chips first. I try to think of the biggest thing that could be done and then do it. It is more probable that the household's daily newspaper will be printed wirelessly in the home during the night. Domestic management, the problems of heat, light and household mechanics will be freed from all labour through beneficent wireless power. Perhaps the most valuable application of wireless energy will be the propulsion of flying machines, which will carry no fuel and will be free from any limitations of the present airplanes and dirigibles. We shall ride from New York to Europe in a few hours. International boundaries will be largely obliterated and a great step will be made towards the unification and harmonious existence of the various races inhabiting the globe. Wireless will not only make possible the supply of energy to a region, however inaccessible, but it will be effective politically by harmonizing international interests. It will create understanding instead of differences. I foresee the development of the flying machine exceeding that of the automobile, and I expect Mr. Ford to make large contributions towards this progress. 
the problem of parking automobiles and furnishing separate roads for commercial and pleasure traffic will be solved. Belted parking towers will arise in our large cities and the roads will be multiplied through sheer necessity, or finally rendered unnecessary when civilization exchanges wheels for wings. Edison ought to know a good deal about transportation, however, so I asked him what improvements were probable in the means of transportation. Edison answered the aeroplane question. He answered it by telling a story. Ten years ago, he was sitting in front of his winter laboratory in Florida. Not a cloud was in the sky. The smoke from a neighboring chimney went up, straight up for a thousand feet. Almost as high as the pillar of smoke soared a buzzard. Whether the bird circled, slid, or climbed, it never flapped a wing. Always its wings were like the hands of a clock at quarter to three. Edison marveled. With no wind blowing, with no wing flapping, what kept the bird aloft? What enabled it to climb after it had slid down the air? I think I know what kept that bird in the air. It travelled on sound waves, and the little pin feathers on the inside of its wings made the waves. The air, when struck with sufficient quickness, is as rigid as steel. Suppose you had four million trained bumblebees attached to wire wickerwork on which was sealed a man. Can't you understand that if the bumblebees were signalled to fly, they would lift the man? I believe mechanical bumblebees could be so attached to a flying machine that they would lift it straight up. By mechanical bumblebees, I mean inclined planes revolving upon perpendicular shafts at tremendous speed. And once in the air, ordinary propellers could be used to drive the machine ahead. Edison believes the present type of aeroplanes will soon be discarded, and that bumblebee flyers will carry passengers at the rate of a hundred miles or more. Mr. Tesla regards the emergence of woman as one of the most profound portents for the future. It is clear to any trained observer and even to the sociologically untrained, that a new attitude towards sex discrimination has come over the world through the centuries. This struggle of the human female towards sex equality will end in a new sex order, with the female as superior. It is not in the shallow physical imitation of men that women will assert first their equality and later their superiority, but in the awakening of the intellect of women. The female mind has demonstrated a capacity for all the mental acquirements and achievements of men, and as generations ensue, that capacity will be expanded. The average woman will be as educated as the average man, and then better educated. For the dormant faculties of her brain will be stimulated to an activity that will be all the more intense and powerful because of centuries of repose. The acquisition of new fields of endeavour by women, their gradual usurpation of leadership, will dull and finally dissipate feminine sensibilities, will choke the maternal instinct so that marriage and motherhood may become abhorrent and human civilization draw closer and closer to the perfect civilization of the bee. The centre of all bee life is the queen. She dominates the hive not through hereditary right for any egg may be hatched into a reigning queen, but because she is the womb of this insect race. There are the vast, desexualized armies of workers whose sole aim and happiness in life is hard work. It is the perfection of communism, of socialized cooperative life wherein all things, including the young, are the property and concern of all. Industrially and politically, Edison looks for a lively future. He believes serious industrial troubles, clashes of a sort that will threaten dynasties and thrones, are due in Europe any time, and that similar troubles will be due in this country in ten years. I believe that all England will someday stop at the sound of one command, and that the command of a working man. Such is the world that Edison sees coming, what a flashlight picture of the future, man at last coming into his own. 
because his brain that has developed so slowly has told him that everything on Earth in the sky and beyond the sky are his own. That the lightning can be bended to his will, the cataract harnessed to his need, and the dead iron in rocks fashioned into tongues that speak and hands that make. Hands such as never were human hands. Hands that can spin a thread of silk or crush a ton of rock. Hands that can make in abundance whatever human beings need. In such a world, how can there be poverty? There will be no poverty in the world a hundred years from now. There is no limit to the cheapness with which things can be made. The world will soon be flooded with the cheap products of machinery. Not the poor products, the cheap products. I think the coming farmer will be a man on a seat, beside a push-button and some levers. The present trend all points to this conclusion. Edison says that today the most civilized countries of the world spend a maximum of their income on war and a minimum on education. The 21st century will reverse this order. It will be more glorious to fight against ignorance than to die on the field of battle. The discovery of a new scientific truth will be more important than the squabbles of diplomats. The newspapers of the 21st century will give a mere stick in the back pages to accounts of crime or political controversies but will headline on the front pages the proclamation of a new scientific hypothesis. Progress along such lines will be impossible while nations persist in the savage practice of killing each other off. I inherited from my father, an erudite man who laboured hard for peace, an ineradicable hatred of war. Like other inventors, I believed at one time that war could be stopped by making it more destructive. But I found that I was mistaken. I underestimated man's combative instinct, which it will take more than a century to breed out. We cannot abolish war by outlawing it. We cannot end it by disarming the strong. War can be stopped not by making the strong weak, but by making every nation, weak or strong, able to defend itself. I was fortunate enough to evolve a new idea and to perfect means which can be used chiefly for defence. If it is adopted, it will revolutionise the relations between nations. It will make any country, large or small, impregnable against armies, airplanes and other means of attack. My invention requires a large plant, but once it is established it will be possible to destroy anything, man or machine, approaching within a radius of 200 miles. I want to state explicitly that this invention of mine does not contemplate the use of any so-called death rays. Rays are not applicable because they cannot be produced in requisite quantities and diminish rapidly in intensity with distance. All the energy of New York City, approximately 2 million horsepower, transformed into rays and projected 20 miles, could not kill a human being, because according to a well-known law of physics, it would disperse to such an extent as to be ineffectual. Unless mankind's attention is too violently diverted by external wars and internal revolutions, there is no reason why the electric millennium should not begin in a few decades. War being hell, what Edison thinks of war and what he has done to make war more like hell are left to the last. If governments don't heed, Edison believes that they will be destroyed by their own peoples. In his opinion, governments will heed by making the Hague Tribunal the supreme court of the world. He believes the people are going to provide these means. He believes there are stormy days ahead for the man who would take what another man makes. He believes there will be cracks in the walls of government and rips in constitutions that the working man, the man who will someday say to England, stand still, will compel governments to serve him and destroy any government that will not serve him. Moreover, he believes things ought to be changed. Civilization, he says, is not on the right basis. A few are getting too much, and the rest, not enough. There will be some big experiments tried in government within the next 50 years. All of us may not be here to see the spectre of poverty laid away, but according to Edison, a few of the youngest will hear the rattle of musketry 
over its grave. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of After School. It's been great to see these words come to life. If you enjoyed this collaboration, head over to Voices of the Past for more first-hand historical diaries and accounts. From ancient Egypt to Soviet Russia, there's something for everyone. Thanks again for watching.